Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to another edition of the mRNA Applications in Discovery and Development Digital Week, brought to you by the producers of the TIE event series at Informa. My name is Michael Dunnett, Head of Sales of the TIE series, and I am joined today by Thomas Costellas, Product Manager for PDNA mRNA at Sartorius. Thomas's presentation today is going to be on chromatography in mRNA production from analytics to purification. Just a couple of housekeeping things from us today. If you do want to submit a question, please do feel free to do so in the chat pod on the right hand side. Um, if we don't get to everybody's questions, don't worry. Uh, Thomas will be able to follow up with you after the event. Thomas, welcome, and uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, it's wonderful to be here and you know to have this chance to to present at the Tides webinar series. Um, I am stepping in for my ro my colleague Rok Sekirnik, um, who is uh, currently shown on the slide here, um, and I hope that you know we can provide by the end of um, this webinar. Uh, uh, some useful information and some um, input into how to improve um, you, uh, and how to evolve your mRNA production processes. And, and so the focus on the talk here is to talk about using chromatography in the mRNA production process uh, and touching this um, from two different perspectives or two different points of view. So one of them will be the analytical side of things, um, which is let's say typically the first part or the first uh, requirement to be able to successfully develop a production and the purification process. And then the second aspect will be to look at um, how we can purify um, with high efficiency and high productivity mRNA to be used in, um, in, in, manuf in uh, clinical trials and in commercial manufacturing of um, mRNA therapies. And so we've, we, we all, of course, know that mRNA has been a strongly evolving area over the past few years. And so a lot of the technologies and a lot of the techniques that were implemented into the production of, um, of mRNA have not been fully optimized or fully, um, let's say, evolved from the traditional uh, production and purification methods um, that, that have been used for the last 30 years in the mRNA field. And so during this presentation, I hope to touch on, um, first of all, uh, some of the general structural properties of mRNA, understanding the structure and the physical and chemical properties of the molecule will allow us to develop and design production and purification strategies that will give us uh, high quality um, mRNA products with good, um, with good biological activity. And then look at, um, the different phases or the different steps in the production process, starting from the IVT analytics, where we have seen um, at Sartorius over the past few years that uh, there is a bottleneck in terms of how we can characterize, how we can, um, how we can monitor, how we can understand what is happening inside of these IVT processes. So here we will, I will be showing uh, some analytical solutions that we have been developing and implementing into the mRNA production workflow before I go on to, to discuss some of the um, downstream or purification aspects in the mRNA production process, touching at it from two different points. The first one will be to look at uh, high throughput solutions that can be implemented, whether it's in discovery for high throughput screening, high throughput uh, production of different RNA constructs, or you know, using these high throughput solutions to optimize um, our purification processes from a more, let's say, design of experiment point of view to get the best possible output of our downstream of our chromatographic processes. And I will, I will use a case study or I will use examples based on affinity chromatography, which uses oligo -DT purification of mRNA um, to showcase some of these examples. Before I then go on to talk about um, some other solutions, other tools, which are also frequently used in purification of mRNA. And these are multimodal chromatographic columns, um, which um, 
can be used to purify also mRNA directly from IVT reactions. Finally, um, I will touch a little bit on uh, double-strand RNA uh, purification. So this would be, let's say, a polishing step in the process of mRNA purification. And um, I will base this off, again, um, an example um, of a purification process um, where double-strand RNA contamination is removed from the final product after an initial capture step with affinity chromatography. And so I think that, uh, or I hope that some of the solutions here will um, will help everyone working in the mRNA field. Um, specifically, I hope to show that, you know, with improving the analytics or improving the monitoring of the IVT reactions, we can actually double the yield um, that we can achieve in an IVT process uh, and increase the productivity by, uh, by a significant margin. Uh, and so this is something that um, really can reduce the cost of production of these mRNA therapies and result in, um, in wider implementation and cheaper implementation of mRNA um, as a therapeutic and as a vaccine modality. So the, the first, let's say, point to look at is, as mentioned, you know, the structure of the mRNA molecule. And we are all very well familiar with this, so we'll not stay on it very long. Um, but summarizing it, we have a single strand RNA molecule, which consists of a few different, uh, a few different uh, parts. Uh, we have the main coding sequence in the middle, which defines, um, defines let's say, the, the protein, the therapeutic protein or the target protein that we want to express inside of the cell. This coding sequence is, is covered on both sides or is flanked on both sides by two untranslated regions, two UTRs. And then very critical um, in, a, in a mature mRNA, so in a, in, in a mature mRNA molecule which can be or express a protein inside of a cell, we need to have uh, two regulatory elements. One of them is a five prime cap, um, and then the other one is a poly A tail. And both of these are elements which need to be present in the final molecule, in the final structure, to give us biological activity of messenger RNA. So we need to ensure during the production process that we have all of these elements in the structure. Now, the size of the mRNA molecule depends primarily on, on a few factors. The first one is the coding sequence. So if we're trying to encode a protein which requires a larger coding sequence, we will have consequently a longer mRNA molecule. Now, the second aspect which affects the size of the mRNA we're using is whether we're, we're working with, let's say, standard or regular mRNA, or if we're working with, for example, self-amplified mRNA molecules. So there are different aspects which will affect the size of the molecule. But if we look at mRNA as an overall modality, and we compare it to what would be a traditional biologic, we still have a molecule which is in weight or in, in, in mass 10 times the size of for example, a monoclonal um, antibody. And so purification really has to take this into account. We're talking here about large biomolecules, um, and we're talking about molecules which can be sensitive uh, to, to external forces like shear stress um, and potentially damaged uh, during the production process. Now, if we, if we think about then not just the physical, but also the chemical structure of the mRNA, we have... Um, actually very versatile um, chemical properties in the mRNA molecule. On one side, we have the entire negatively charged phosphate backbone. This retains a negative charge across, let's say, the entire stability range of the mRNA. So this is something important when we're doing purification of mRNA because the negative charge will have an effect um, on how we implement the different, um, let's say, chromatographic methods in purification of messenger RNA. On the other side, we also have the, uh, the nucleic acid residues, so the bases, um, which give the molecule a more hydrophobic character and which also give the molecule the ability to form uh, hybridized pairs um, with other RNA sequences. So we can either have um, secondary structures forming, and I'll touch on this um, later on, or we can have you know, fragments 
pieces of aberrant RNA sticking or binding onto the mRNA molecule itself. Another positive aspect of this um, of this structure is that you know by hybridization we can actually develop affinity chromatographic media, which allows us to purify messenger RNA with specific um, targeted affinity depending on the sequence of the RNA we're trying to, to, to purify. So if we look at, if we think about the actual structure of mRNA, I've mentioned that, you know, this is a single strand mRNA molecule, but if we look at it, you know, a bit more in depth, you know, the ability of mRNA to form these hybridized pairs or the ability of nucleic acids to, to form these hybridized pairs result in formation of a very complex secondary structure um, within these mRNA molecules. So if we look uh, on the, uh, at, let's say, this EGFP construct, um, where we simulate it using one of these um, lowest or minimal free energy prediction models, uh, we, we've, pre we've simulated the secondary structure. We can see that, you know, this molecule in itself has very little resemblance to an actual single strand mRNA molecule. We're actually looking at a very complex secondary structure, and the secondary structure can further, um, let's say, let's say, reconnect on itself and form tertiary structures um, for the mRNA as well. So the structure is actually very complex, and the structure is also dynamic. If we subject our mRNA to, to different conditions, for example, physiological environment or a higher salt environment, we would expect this structure to actually change as well. So it's a dynamic and complex structure. The benefit or, or the advantage of, of this is that regardless of the sequence that we enter into one of these prediction models, we always see that uh, there is a large loop shown here on, on the on the zoomed in section. And, and this large loop, which is not part of a, of, a, of a secondary structure, is actually the poly A tail. And so this poly A tail is very welcome um, because we can actually use the poly A tail to capture um, and to purify the mRNA using affinity chromatography. And this is where we actually get to, uh, to thinking about, you know, what purification methods to use and what uh, chromatographic options we can implement in purification of mRNA. And we need to think about, you know, all of these physical and all of these chemical structures and how they affect the selection of a suitable type of chromatographic column. So the first aspect that I've mentioned was the actual size of the mRNA molecule, you know, being a very large biologic, we need to ensure that the chromatographic options that we're using or the purification options we're using allow sufficient accessible surface area for this size of particles. So we can think about, you know, traditional resin-based media, which have these really small, for example, dead end pores on their surface. The mRNA molecule is excessive or too large to actually fit into a traditional, let's say, porous type of chromatographic resin. And so we use typically, you know, this so-called convective chromatographic media, um, like we see here, the monolith, which, which gives us a stationary phase structure with very large interconnected channels. And within these channels, the mRNA molecule is very free to flow and is very free to bind onto all of the binding sites which are located on the walls of these channels. So we have a chromatographic structure which allows sufficient surface area to bind um, the or to to effectively allow flow of the, these large mRNA molecules through the column. Now the second aspect is the shear sensitivity or the the you know making sure that we, we provide a low shear environment into uh, for, for chromatography or when we're doing purification of these mRNA molecules. And again, we want to avoid you know the formation of um, turbulence or of uh, turbulence-induced shear stress, which can have a, a negative impact uh, on the integrity and stability of mRNA, especially, you know, the larger the mRNA molecule, typically, you know, the more, um, the more sensitivity we would expect in terms of um, shear forces. Once we, so, so then the next step we, we need to look at is, you know, the actual flow properties or the flow profile uh, through these types of chromatographic media. 
And so what we're trying to use is, um, and what we're implementing at Sartorius is, again, convective mass transport. And the convective mass transport aspect in chromatography is very important from two perspectives. The first one is flow independent performance of chromatographic media. So we can actually you know, vary flow rates during the purification and get minimal or no impact on purification results. And then the second one is ease of scalability. So convective mass transport facilitates transition from one scale to the next because we can avoid or we can eliminate residence time as a factor in the purification of these biologics. Um, and, and finally, of course, we need to consider the capacity um, of, these, um, of these purification media. So we need to ensure that we have um, good binding capacity when we're doing purification. So this is, you know, these are all properties which come from the stationary phase, so from the actual matrix uh, that we have on the, on the chromatographic medium. And then, of course, the selectivity or the actual purification happens at the level of the surface chemistry of the chromatographic media. And this is where we need to um, where we need to look at you know the different options or the different ligands which are typically present on the surface of this chromatographic medium. So you know just summarizing um, from, from the previous slide, you know this monolithic structure provides us with large convective channels which do not impede or do not hinder the flow of the mRNA molecules throughout the column. And so this allows us to have very high resolution and flow independent resolution and capacity in chromatography. Now, we also ensure that we have accessible binding sites and that we have minimal uh, or no um, turbulent mixing, which would be, um, let's say, uh, for generating shear forces during the chromatography. Now, the mRNA production workflow, you, you know, we, it's not fair to just look at production of mRNA as IVT uh, production and then downstream purification, but we actually need to consider that, you know, the plasmid DNA molecule is actually an integral part of, um, of the mRNA production workflow. And so very often we're seeing, um, you know, there's, there's of course, a, a divide and a transition happening on whether mRNA is insourced or manufactured within the company or whether it's outsourced and produced by an external organization. Now, regardless of the approach um, adopted, you know, whether the, the plasmid DNA is produced and linearized, um, you know, within the same facility, um, we always need to ensure that the quality of the plasmid we're using in the IVT reaction is as good, as, as high as possible. And this is to avoid potential bottlenecks later on in the downstream or in the purification of the um, of the mRNA products, and so this slide here outline, outlines, let's say, a standard purification approach we normally implement in production of plasmid DNA, um, where I, I won't go into all of the steps, but we perform an initial chromatographic capture uh, on the lysate using a weak anion exchange DEAE uh, monolith. Then we perform linearization where we convert all of the isoforms of the plasmid, so open circular, supercoiled, um, linear, and so on, into the linear form of the plasmid DNA before we perform a polishing step, which is designed to remove uh, enzymes, remove contaminants, remove endotoxins, uh, and other impurities which are still present in the sample. Um, we, we implement this approach, uh, and typically we can produce very high quality plasmid DNA, which can be used effectively in the IVT reaction process. Now, I've mentioned in the introduction, analytics are key to understanding what's happening in the process. And so in this plasmid DNA workflow, we implement um, these HPLC analytics, which provide us very rapid information on the different isoform content in our sample at any of these manufacturing steps. So we can monitor the quality um, of each of the unit operations and ensure that the linear plasmid DNA we produce at the end is clear of any other isoforms um, of, of plasmids. And this is where we then get to, uh, you know, the, the purified plasmids, which we can use um, in the IVT reaction. And um, I, I will not touch on the plasmid aspect anymore since the focus here is um, on the IVT. 
IVT itself is, let's say, the, the critical, so it's the production step in the mRNA workflow. And a lot of, or most of the development focus should be aimed at optimizing and improving this step in the process because it will have a direct impact on the quality of the product and on the development of the purification steps that follow. So if we can improve, if we can optimize the IVT reaction to the point where we reduce the, the load of contaminants in the sample, we can actually facilitate and improve the purification of the mRNA um, in the downstream process. So I will touch on this um, IVT reaction more extensively and talk about some of the analytical tools um, that we implement. And then, um, oh, I'm sorry about that. And, and then I will talk about the chromatographic toolbox. So the Simultus toolbox, um, which give you different options um, and allow you to produce or purify mRNA regardless of how the upstream is performed. So all in all, you know, chromatography in an mRNA workflow comes in at many different places or at many different steps in the production process, starting from uh, the raw material control. And this includes, like I've talked about, the plasmid DNA, but also, you know, all of the reagents going into the IVT reaction, for example, the NTPs, the cutting reagents, the enzymes. We can use HPLC, we can use chromatography to look at the purity and quality of each of these uh, critical raw materials in the IVT reaction. Um, we also have IVT monitoring at number two. This is the one I will focus on later on. And then, you know, after the purification step, which is, let's say, the within this workflow or within this flowchart, um, it, it is the only, uh, let's say, downstream or purification implementation of chromatography. Um, after this purification, we have, you know, the, the downstream or the product drug substance analytics, and this includes you know, the, the purity, the quality, stability studies, and so on, which are all areas or all applications where chromatography is very valuable and can provide a lot of information. And so, touching on the IVT reaction itself, so this is um, the first part or the first step in the mRNA production process. And despite, you know, being a synthetic reaction and you know, having become very widely acknowledged and widely known um, as a fast and easy way to produce mRNA, it is still a complex process, you know, where we have approximately 12 or 13 different reagents combined together in, in, a, in a reaction vessel and reacting at a very high pace. So here we see reaction times of two to three hours, which produce a very high yield of RNA product. And so we need, you know, here we, we're faced with a very different problem compared to a traditional biologics process where, you know, we have these fermentations which take place over two to three days. And we can actually run, let's say, analytics alongside a traditional bioreactor um, and get our results back in time. In the case of mRNA, we're faced with the situation where we're producing mRNA so rapidly that most of the traditional analytical methods cannot provide results, cannot provide, provide data fast enough to be able to make decisions on the IVT reaction in real time. So this is where we're implementing uh, chromatography in this analytical um, workflow, typically um, from two different aspects. So the first one, which, which may be familiar or will be very familiar to, to most uh, RNA or mRNA producers, which would be this, let's say, affinity chromatography. So we can take an affinity ligand and place it in an analytical-sized column, and we get, you know, a, a very rapid HPLC assay, which can quantify the amount of polyadenylated mRNA in a sample in a very short time. So this is CMAC oligodt, and in a way, it is, let's say, analogous to looking to, to thinking of it as protein A for mRNA. So we have this affinity approach, which analyzes the sample, and it gives us one output. So it gives us the titer or the concentration of the RNA in the sample. Now, this is a one-dimensional approach, so a one-dimensional assay. If we want to understand more of what is happening inside of the IVT reaction, we actually need to implement analytical methods which can provide us a multi-dimensional or multi-parameter view 
into the IBT reaction. Uh, and this is where we've developed this new um, approach using this CMAC Prima S multimodal column, which allows us to separate in approximately three minutes in a, in a salt gradient, um, we can separate the RNA material or the RNA product from the DNA template um, and individual nucleotides and cutting reagents which are present in the IBT reaction. And so we can take this assay within three minutes, get results back from the reaction, from the IBT process, exactly how much RNA we have produced, exactly how much of each of the nucleotides we have left inside of the IBT reaction. The way we implement it is to operate or to, to take samples from an IVT reaction, and it takes a very small amount of sample, typically one to two microliters from the IVT reaction, diluted and injected onto the, um, onto the system, onto the analytical HPLC system. Uh, and so we can look at you know, what's happening inside of the IVT reaction in almost real time, where we can take samples every 5, 10, 20, 30 minutes and quantify the production of RNA and the consumption of all of these different nucleotides. We can then plot all of these on a kinetics curve, uh, on a plot which shows the kinetics or the production of mRNA and use that to make comparisons between different conditions used in the IVT reaction and to take rapid decisions on when to stop an IVT reaction and when to process or purify uh, the resulting product. And the objective or the let's say the result is that you know we can we can start to learn how to control these IVT reactions much more effectively, uh, and you know you can if you give this tool to to a scientist for example you know what what they will do then is uh, start to develop or, or start to play games in a way uh, where they will start an IVT reaction they will control the kinetics to produce mRNA at a very slow rate and then you know decides at some point that they need to speed up or increase the rate of production of RNA add the right reagents into the reaction and actually be able to uh, increase the productivity or the production of this IVT process um, in a very controlled manner. You can also take um, an IVT reaction and you know, you decide that you want to pause the IVT production at a certain point. So you, you, know, you, you just remove the reagents which um, allow production of RNA and then you, know, you leave it paused while you go for lunch, and then when you come back, you can resume the IVT reaction and continue producing RNA. So our objective overall is, is the situation, for example, shown on the bottom right in this panel, in this slide. And, and this would be you know, to have a very um, consistent um, production of RNA, um, reaching a high yield, so a high productivity in our IVT reaction, and consuming our reagents our nucleotides at an equally uh, steady pace, dropping or resulting in complete utilization of these nucleotides at the end of the process. So this would indicate, you know, that we have optimized uh, these IVT reactions to a sufficient degree that we get high yield and we get the best possible utilization of all of the building blocks we put in the IVT reaction. So, you know, developing these assays can sometimes be problematic, problematic time-consuming, and so, you know, what, what we're also doing is we're implementing uh, these analytical methods directly into uh, PathFix, which is a purpose-designed or it's a biocompatible uh, biochromatography platform, which allows us to um, implement all of the assays, all of the analytical methods developed directly into the platform. So setting up the analytics with Chromatography with HPLC becomes much more simple. All it takes is installing Patrix in a new laboratory, in a new facility, and then operating you know, the, 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 the analysis based on the instructions provided within the system itself. And so this Patrix platform is designed to, to reduce or to shorten the development timelines to actually eliminate development of analytical methods. And it's also designed to speed up the training um, of of uh, new technicians and new um, analytical uh, members. So this HPLC method or this CMAC Prima S assay can, you know, can be used very effectively to, to gain understanding of the IVT reaction and to efficiently uh, develop IVT processes. We can actually take it a step further 
and use the, the same assay to look at capping efficiency, for example. So uh, we can do this by expanding or by preparing uh, the sample that we want to analyze before subjecting it to this uh, Prima S analysis. And you know, if we want to look at the capping efficiency, for example, what we can do is take the combination of, of, of nucleases or an exonuclease, um, which is specifically targeting, for example, uncapped mRNA. And so when we take you know, a sample from the IBT reaction, we would split it in two parts. One of them would be a control sample. The other one would be treated with exonuclease. And we would then compare the areas of the RNA peaks obtained um, using this using this um, analytical method. And when we compare the peak areas, you know, the the, ends, the sample treated with nuclease will not contain uncapped mRNA. And so we can effectively quantify the amount of capped or, or the amount the capping efficiency inside of um, our IVT process. Or you know, a secondary IVT reaction, whether it's done uh, in the same, let's say, co-transcriptional IVT process or as a secondary capping, capping step. We can see here two examples, one of them where we analyze uncapped mRNA um, and, you know, we, we, we look at, you know, the, the area of the RNA peak with nuclease is completely digested. We only see the enzyme and the digestion products. Uh, in contrast, when we look at a, a a capped mRNA, in this case, you know, this was a sample based on um, on this clean cap reagent. We can see that, you know, the uh, peak for the RNA is actually maintained. We have, if we compare the areas, we can see we have very high capping efficiency, which is um, what we expect um, from a process developed based on on this type of capping approach. And, and so this Prima S assay, it allows us to gain a lot of understanding of the IVT process. And so we can start to think about how to implement, you know, the, the, the new knowledge that we gained, specifically, you know, the kinetics of the production of RNA and the kinetics of consumption of nucleotides. You know, th this is data that can help us also develop new production strategies. And so we can transition from a traditional or a typical batch process where all of the IVT components are placed in one reaction, ves reaction vessel, left to react for two hours and purified, we can go from this standard batch approach to a fed batch approach where we start an IBT reaction, we monitor, we control the consumption of nucleotides, and at the point you know, where the nucleotides fall below a certain level, we can actually refeed or add additional nucleotides into the IBT reaction. And we can see this on the, on the graph on the right-hand side where we have these feeding points where we've manually added um, these nucleotides into the IVT reaction, and it allowed us to continue producing RNA. Um, and on the left side, we can see the total RNA concentration produced um, in this process, where we can see, you know, that at the end we can reach yields of 10 to 12 grams per liter within an IVT process. And this is by using the same amount of uh, starting materials, just feeding um, additional nucleotides. So the cost for the capping reagent and the cost for the enzymes used in the process will actually be maintained or not increased in this production. So we've increased the productivity, we've approximately doubled uh, the productivity in this uh, by adopting this fat batch approach, and we've actually reduced the cost of goods because we're not uh, adding additional, let's say, critical uh, components in this IVT reaction, such as the capping reagents and um, the enzymes. So this, if we if we take this graph on the right, where we have you know the consumption of nucleotides, we, we can actually calculate the kinetics of the nucleotide consumption and, and develop a model, which would allow us then to automate the feeding of nucleotides into the IVT reaction. And, and so we can take, for example, an Ember two hundred and fifty or a similar. Um, system which allows us to automatically feed nutrients or let's say reagents into this IVT reaction and we can implement this model so this kinetics model into the ember system and it allows us to um, effectively feed or develop a feeding strategy which maintains the consumption of nucleotide the level of nucleotides in the IVT reaction consistent 
So if we look at the graph on the left here, we can see the curves for each of the different uh, nucleotides in the IVT reaction. And, and we can see that, you know, after the continuous feed is started, you know, we can actually maintain the level of these nucleotides very consistent, which allows us to continuously produce uh, RNA um, inside of this IVT reactor. So we can do this, you know, by, by having a combination of this automated feeding, automated addition of nucleotides with the help of, um, of, of this AMBER system and the knowledge and experience we get from utilizing the PATFIX uh, PRIMA-S method to understand the use and the consumption of these nucleotides. So at the end of one of these processes in this uh, 250 milliliter reactor vessel um, with, let's say, a working reaction volume in this case of around 200 milliliters, we can achieve a yield of approximately 11 grams per liter in the IVT reaction. So it gives us roughly two grams um, of mRNA, two grams of, of, um, of messenger RNA, which we need to then purify. And two grams of mRNA is, is you know, in terms of uh, doses would actually allow us to complete, uh, you know, already clinical studies or is sufficient to produce uh, clinical uh, amounts of, of mRNA. And so purification then, of course, needs to follow. Uh, and this is where, you know, we need to implement um, some of these different chromatographic techniques, again, um, that, that can give us, same way as in chromatography, very rapid uh, and very efficient purification um, of, the, of the mRNA. And so this, is a, this slide is a quick summary. Um, it, it, it will probably be familiar to, uh, to most. Um, that we can use affinity chromatography using this oligo-DT18 um, monolith, um, so chromatographic column, to capture mRNA directly from an IVT reaction. So all we do is we take an IVT reaction, we dilute it with a binding buffer, which increases the salt concentration in the sample, and then we load the material directly onto the chromatographic column. And this allows us to very effectively uh, separate the polyadenylated species um, from contaminants, from impurities, which do not have a poly A tail. And this is done typically with very high uh, efficiency and very high purity at the end of the purification step. So the question would be then, you know, can we, can we go beyond this traditional approach where we use sodium chloride for purification on the affinity column? And so we, we've actually, you know, looked at how we can implement the combination of, you know, high throughput uh, chromatographic methods, for example, this 96 well played format um, described on this slide here. We've combined that with a design of experiment approach where we, um, where we developed or, or, or let's say de developed specific experiments we wanted to run using this uh, high throughput um, testing system or testing method with the 96 well paid format. So within, let's say, one run or one analytical run um, on these 96 well paid, we can actually test, you know, many different parameters, many different conditions. And so we can get, you know, very high um, or very fast output um, from, from these uh, optimization experiments. And so we've tested you know, some, some different additives in the buffers and in the samples, which can promote or increase the binding capacity on the oligo -DT media. And we've identified you know, within this study, for example, the effect of uh, guanidine and the effect of magnesium um, being significant uh, to, in, in improving the binding capacity of the oligo -DT columns. And so, you know, show, looking at, at the, let's say, contour plot uh, on, on the right-hand side, we've identified that using uh, guanidine hydrochloride, we can actually go from, a, let's say, typical binding capacity of three to four milligrams per milliliter. We can increase that to, I think, five or even beyond six milligrams per milliliter. So using this 96 well paid format, we can very effectively screen binding conditions, screen elution conditions, and use that to optimize our chromatographic steps. And then, of course, you know, this is a high throughput approach. We then also need to transfer this 
onto um, onto a purification size column so we can actually take these conditions we can translate them to the simultus to the purification columns and we can reproduce the same experiments the same data where we have you know using this guanidine approach we can achieve uh, six milligrams per milliliter and you know sometimes even higher depending on the rna constructs so oligodity in different formats you know 96 well paid can allow us to screen and optimize the conditions Oligodity in a purification format allows us to get very high capacity and purify very large amounts of mRNA. And in the past, we have also shown that purification by chromatography, when compared to traditional, um, let's say, methods like, like precipitation, which is still very often used in, in let's say, in, in a research setting, um, purification by chromatography can give us mRNA of much higher stability compared to uh, to these other methods. And so we've actually done and published a um, stability study where we looked at the thermal and freeze-thaw stability of, um, of mRNA produced or purified in different ways. And we found that, you know, mRNA purified by oligodity was stable um, at room temperature or even 37 degrees for, I believe, up to a month. And we've used a whole range of different analytical methods, including uh, you know, uh, let's say uh, a gel, which would be a non-quantitative way, uh, and bioanalyzer, and we've also compared that to you know different um, analytical chromatographic methods, like the ones I've described in the previous slides, so CMAC oligodt and CMAC Prima S, to look at, you know, to, to get the same output and confirm it with different analytical methods. So, oligodt is a very versatile approach. Uh, but it is only one of the ways we can use affinity chromatography for mRNA purification. We can actually um, develop and produce customized ligands for purification of mRNA or RNA constructs. Uh, and so, you know, this is an approach where we can take a specific RNA sequence, which is complementary to a product, to, to, a, to an mRNA or RNA molecule, molecule we want to purify, and we can immobilize or covalently bind one of these uh, oligonucleotides onto the stationary phase, onto the monolith, to give us a specific affinity product. And so this expands the use of affinity chromatography beyond just messenger RNA, which has the poly-A tail, but we can actually develop affinity columns for any type of RNA molecule, whether it has a poly-A tail or not. And this includes constructs like circular RNA, like guide RNAs, you know, like long non-coding RNA. So all of these different um, RNA modalities, which at the moment do not have an effective or an efficient um, affinity capture method. So affinity chromatography, fantastic tool for purification. And, you know, just, uh, just an example here where, where we, we've coupled um, a sequence of uh, DG uh, nucleotides onto the monolith and use that to bind uh, or to capture, uh, you know, an, an mRNA or an RNA molecule which contained a tail of polycetidine uh, residues um, in the sequence. Uh, and so this is just, let's say, one example, but any uh, specific oligonucleotide can be mobilized onto the structure of the column and used for purification of, of RNA. Now, Moving beyond affinity chromatography, we also need to ask ourselves what can we do when um, what can we do when we don't have a poly A tail? You know, what, what other alternatives do we have? And this is where multimodal chromatography comes in handy. You know, we can use you know this Prima S column, which we've looked at before in the analytical aspect. We can use this same type of monolith, same type of ligand, but in a larger sized column, and we can use that to effectively capture and separate the RNA from the IVT components. And the way this works is typically we implement a different approach. So instead of doing a salt gradient, we're doing this pH gradient where we apply the IVT reaction at a neutral pH onto the column. And then we perform a high salt wash, which removes the DNA template and some other IVT components. And then we perform a pH gradient elution, which isolates the mRNA uh, product. Now, you know, this 
pH illusion takes place at, at the pH of approximately 10.5, which is a, a relatively high pH in terms of RNA stability. And so we, we were naturally concerned about how to ensure that we have stable RNA in the illusion. And so we've, you know, we, we haven't been able to change the illusion pH, but we've been able to develop um, a protocol or a process where we neutralize the eluate from the pre-mass column immediately. And this allows us to produce RNA, um, which is in stability similar to the mRNA purified by oligodity. So we've again subjected the, some RNA constructs, you know, to this high pH purification and then neutralization. And then we've, you know, looked at the stability uh, at room temperature for 28 days and we found that the RNA is stable uh, at these conditions. So Prima S is an, a good alternative. You know, when we don't have a poly A tail, we can use this multimodal approach, or when we have constructs which are not messenger RNA and therefore don't have a poly A tail, we can use this Prima S approach. Uh, but is there a way that we can uh, reduce the elution pH? And so this is something we're currently investigating and you know looking at different prototype ligands, which can help us achieve um, a lower pH elution. And in doing so, you know, we've identified one construct or one ligand uh, called Prima H. Um, for now, this is a prototype, uh, but it, it has you know a, a different uh, zeta potential curve, and so it has a different pi, um, which means that which allows us to perform purification of RNA in much more neutral conditions. And so, you know, we can aim or or, or we can target elution of the RNA at the pH. Uh, which would be much more friendly to the stability uh, and long-term uh, stability of the RNA constructs. And, and we've tested uh, the, this Prima-H prototype, and we can see here, you know, just a sample workflow of how of how we typically perform this. The approach is very similar to the Prima-S uh, method, where we load or we bind at relatively neutral pH. And we follow this by high salt wash, uh, which removes um, our DNA template. And then we do a pH gradient elution where we elute the mRNA at a pH of 7.5. And so we can actually keep you know, the, the RNA in these much more stable conditions. Now, just to finish off, you know, I've, I've promised some data on, um, on polishing or on double strand RNA removal. And here our main focus at the moment is on reverse phase chromatography uh, using this ion pair reverse phase approach, um, which allows us to separate at room temperature uh, in an acetonitrile gradient, um, the, let's say at least some of these double strand RNA species from our main single strand RNA products. And so we can implement, uh, you know, this um, SDVB or this reverse phase chromatography as a polishing method when we need to get rid of, uh, or when we need to separate or reduce the double strand RNA contamination in our products. So just to um, finish off, um, you know, the, I, I've shown the CMAC Prima S, so the uh, Patfix Prima S method, which allows us to optimize the IVT reaction to the point where we can effectively control, um, you know, how fast and how well the RNA is being produced in the IVT reaction. And we can use this also to look at uh, the capping efficiency within an IVT process. By using this Prima S method, we can develop fed batch production of mRNA. So we can actually understand and develop these kinetics curves, which allows us to develop a fed batch approach to produce mRNA. And by doing so, we can increase um, the yields, increase the throughput of the IVT process and decrease the cost of goods um, in, the, in the production process. And then we've also looked at how, you know, we can use high throughput screening um, with this 96 well played format um, to rapidly develop and optimize chromatographic steps and also to do small scale construct screening. And then finally, you know, touching on uh, multimodal capture of mRNA using different, um, different uh, multimodal ligands um, for uh, capture directly from an IVT reaction. And so with that, I would like to thank everyone um, for listening to, to this webinar. I hope that it was very useful um, and at least some of these ideas can be carried into real processes um, within uh, your own work. And of course, 
I am available to answer any questions that, that we can go through and of course to reach out to you um, if we cannot answer your question during this webinar today. Thomas, thank you very much indeed. That was fantastic, very insightful there. Um, as Tom's mentioned, we uh, we do have time, another 10 minutes for questions. So if you do have some questions, please put them into the chat pod on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, there is a lot of questions indeed, Thomas, so we'll, we'll get through these as quickly as we can. Um, but as Thomas mentioned, if not, we'll get back to you on those. So. First question for you, Thomas, is, is there a difference between the analytical Prima S column and the purification column? Well, that's um, a really good question. So um, the monolith inside of the analytical and purification scale columns are identical. So both of them have the same structure, the same properties of the stationary phase. Um, we th th There are then differences within the actual shape, the actual format, you know, the, the simultus purification columns are meant to be uh, a scalable purification approach. And so they, they use this, a, a different flow profile through the column, which allows us to ensure, you know, a consistent and high flow rate scale up when, when we're doing purification of mRNA. But beyond this, you know, the analytical columns are optimized, of course, for resolution um, and high pressure use so you know they they resist 150 bars which the simultus the purification columns um cannot achieve so chromatographically the same uh, the cartridge or the the let's say the the housing gives it different properties which allows its its use in different applications fantastic thank you for the clarification there Next question, does oligo-DT work with self-amplifying mRNA? Um, again, really good question. I've, I've touched on, um, you know, the what affects the size of the RNA we're trying to purify. And yes, self-amplified mRNA versus, let's say, traditional mRNA is, is one of the main factors which affects the size of the molecule we need to purify. And to answer the question, yes, the monolith, uh, oligo-DT, columns can very effectively purify um, mRNA of 10,000 plus nucleotides or so self-amplified mRNA molecules. Fantastic, thank you. And next question for you is, is there any reason not to use immobilized enzymes? This is actually a really interesting question and, um, you know, one that we are also looking into and interested in understanding better. Um, the amount of enzymes used in these processes are typically very small, so the, uh, the activity of these enzymes is typically very high. So immobilizing the enzyme on the column itself or immobilizing an enzyme onto the column would require, you know, potentially, uh, let's say, a, a very small size stationary phase or a very small sized monolith to process a very high volume of IVT. So we, we could actually develop a very small uh, continuous flow um, IVT reactor in a way to, to give us uh, a high productivity or high processing capability uh, for, for production of mRNA. And so this is an area of ongoing investigation, but it is certainly one of the areas or one of the, let's say, projects or aspects that, that you know, is, should be investigated more in depth and uh, to, to provide good answers. But immobilized reactors, uh, immobilized enzymatic reactors um, have been shown to be very effective using these monolithic columns um, in, in other areas, including, for example, protein digestion, you know, where we can immobilize trypsin, for example, and get very high uh, efficiency of uh, protein digestion. So, Proof of concept is there, uh, the, the, let's say, uh, an application of this in an IBT has not yet been shown. Okay, thank you. And how do you compare membrane chromatography and monolith for mRNA purification? 
yes, this is again a very very good question. Um, so within Sartorius, we were using or were implementing the monolith for um, mRNA purification work, and so we have these you know oligodity um, monolithic columns which are designed specifically for purification of messenger RNA, and you know we're not let's say implementing at the moment other um, functionalities. Um, or other types of stationary phase in this workflow. So, you know, at the moment, the focus is on using the monolithic columns, which provide us uh, very efficient, scalable purification of mRNA. Thank you very much. Is it necessary to treat IVT with DNase before oligo-DT chromatography? Okay. Yes, so the answer to this would be typically, you know, within, um, let's say, within the production process, there would be, you know, after an IVT, there's often a quenching step where we either use EDTA or a different approach, which, which neutralizes the activity of enzymes. Um, and so what we would normally do is um, we would perform some kind of quenching or use conditions which prevent the, the activity um, of DNases um, to avoid any potential, let's say, <laughs> digestion or damage on the chromatographic media themselves. So we, th there is normally uh, a, a, a quenching step. And so typically what we do is we use conditions which do not uh, enable the activity of DNases. Thank you very much. Next question for you. Uh, Any tools to characterize mRNA 2D and 3D structures? Are they important for processing and function? Yeah, so the, the, this is a, a great question. I know that I touched on you know, the, the secondary, the tertiary structures of mRNA. Uh, at the moment within Sartorius, we do not have tools um, that can be used to, to, to determine this type of structure. So here we cannot really provide um, provide any, let's say, actual um, recommendations in terms of analytical solutions. Lovely, thank you. Uh, next question for you. SMB is used to make Viagra. Are vaccines using any such and established techniques? Uh, so uh, I just want to make sure I understand the question. SMB, as in bio... I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but to, to answer maybe from, from what I understand, the monoliths are used to produce commercial um, products, you know, commercial gene therapies, and they're used extensively in production of clinical trial or clinical material, uh, both in mRNA and other gene therapy areas. Um, and so implementing this production approach in uh, a GMP environment is, is fully supported by regulatory authorities. Okay. Next question, we've got a couple more minutes. Uh, what is the quantity mRNA we can purify on HPLC? Um, okay, so th this is a question that maybe I can answer from two points of view. So the first one is, are we talking about HPLC as the analytical chromatography with uh, the multimodal Prima S method that I was showing before, which can be used um, to, uh, which can be used also for, let's say, small scale uh, purification. And so here, you know, you know, these analytical columns they have a, a bed or a monolith volume of 100 microliters, and you know, the Prima S columns, for example, has a binding capacity of seven to eight grams per liter. So, you know, using one of these analytical size columns and a Prima S ligand, we could purify on the analytical HPLC, let's say between 700 and 800 micrograms um, of, of mRNA. If we take an oligo -DT affinity column, we would be looking at somewhere between uh, three, uh, 300 and 500 micrograms um, of mRNA purified in this um, analytical scale. Now, if we're talking about HPLC as in reverse phase chromatography, you know, using SDVB uh, for purification of, of mRNA at, at larger scales, 
um, you know, then the capacity of the reverse phase columns is, is lower typically compared to these other multimodal and affinity columns. So typically what we see is a capacity of one gram to two grams per liter on the SDVB column. And so, you know, when we scale this up, when we talk about larger chromatographic columns, we can go, let's say, up to eight liter monolithic columns, which would give us a capacity to purify approximately eight grams, eight to 10 grams of um, of mRNA in one purification run. Got it. That has taken us to the top of the hour. Um, there is over 10 other questions as well that we are still doing, um, that we still have uh, people yet to be answered. So what we'll do, Thomas, is we'll get these across to you so people are able to get those questions answered after the webinar. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. That was uh, fantastically engaging this morning. Uh, do fill out the survey, if you would, after the event as well, so we can improve these processes moving forward. Thomas, any final comments from yourself? Um, again, thank you so much for, for you know, this opportunity. And like, like you said, uh, Michael will reply to all of the questions in a follow-up email. So. Thank you, everyone, again, for all of the great questions.